Hi, I'm Laura. And I'm Jill. And this is Crank Divers. Hello everybody, welcome to today's episode. Hello everyone, hope everyone's well. And here we are for another episode, Jill. Yep, here we are. It's another, 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 did you just bang yourself? I did. Where are we? <laughs> she's she's swinging about on my chair and she's just banged her leg off my desk. So, no sympathy, it's your own fault. Okay. Anyway. Where in the world are we? <laughs> Australia. And the title? The Worst Nana. The Worst Nana? <laughs> yeah. okay. My inspiration came from, because um, my niece Laura's daughter watches The Worst That's Witch. That's exactly what I just The Worst yeah, Witch. The Worst Witch. So... The worst nana. This is the worst nana, although the worst witch is nothing compared to the worst nana. The worst witch is actually just a really nice little girl. I'm intrigued now, (laughs) so shall we just dive in? Yep, okay. So, um, Catherine Mary Knight was born on the 24th of October 1955 in Tenterfield, New South Wales, Australia. And she was actually, just straight off the bat I'm going to tell you, that she was the first Australian woman... To be sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. Oh, right. Yeah, it's just bad. Oh dear. So I hope you're, you know, strapped down, ready for the ride. Because <laughs> she's a bit, a bit of a crazy one. A bit of a crazy one. Okay. Yeah. Let's go. So um, Catherine's mum, Barbara, she had been married to a guy called Jack. They lived in a small town called Aberdeen. Fun, fun fact, there's an Aberdeen in Scotland as well, but this one was in oh, there you go. Australia. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and they had four sons together. So... Um, but like Barbara had an affair with a friend and a co-worker of her husband called Ken Knight. Mm-hmm. So they got found out and it's caused a major scandal because they lived in like such a small town. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's like the 50s. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm not sure what the population was back then, but just to give you an idea, I found out that according to the 2016 census that there were 1,894 people in Aberdeen. So that's how small it is. Yeah, so obviously small. somebody... No in a well known family, they're having an affair, and it's it's a big no no. Yeah, yeah. So after the affair had been discovered, Barbara and Ken had like they had to move because, you know, the scandal. Yes. I keep what to say like Barbie and Ken though. <laughs> but it's like obviously her name was Barbara and I don't think she was anything special. I don't think she was a Barbie. No. Um, so yeah, Barbara and Ken they moved to Tenterfield. So her, her so remember she'd had four sons with her first husband. Yeah. Um, so the two oldest sons stayed with their dad mm-hmm. and the two younger ones were sent to Sydney to be raised by an aunt. Oh. So I'm not sure why she didn't take any of the kids. Or, or why her dad, the dad couldn't have all four. Yeah, I don't. I have absolutely no idea. It seems so. the same shape as split them up. Yeah, I know, like that's that. what I mean. Uh, and I think Sydney was like maybe a couple hours away as well, so it wasn't as if they were like right close, by, close, yeah. close to each other. Mm-hmm. Um. I don't know the reason for that. So Barbara had another four children oh, with Ken, so including twin girls, the youngest of which was Catherine, and her sister was called Joy. So they were the the, the, the twins, Catherine yeah. and Joy. So when Catherine was four, her mum's first husband, Jack, he died. So the two sons that had been living with him now came to live with her and Ken. But still, these two other sons, the younger ones, were still living with the aunt. So it's... I don't know. I, I don't understand why yeah. she never took any kids to start with. And then when the husband died, she yeah. took the two older ones. I know. I don't know. So, the, the, so that would have been six kids uh-huh. and two adults living in this house. Right. And this house wasn't a pleasant house mm-hmm. to live in, to say the least. Mm-hmm. So Ken Knight, the father, he was a violent alcoholic. He would beat his wife, Barbara, and he raped her multiple times a day, like up to ten times a day he would rape her. And he would do it in front of the kids. So they would see their mother being beaten and raped every day. Lovely. So now, even though Barbara was being beaten and raped, she was no saint either. Mm -hmm. Barbara and Ken would take it in turns to beat the children Mm -hmm. and they would use things like like dog leads and electrical cords. So, yeah, neither of them were no no saints there. And like Barbara, she would often tell her daughters intimate details about her sex life. Oh and my God, what? I don't know. And, how, and she would tell them how much she hated sex and how much she hated men. Like, yeah, don't, don't, you don't talk to your daughters no, about stuff like that. Not. 
That's disgusting. And and later on in life, like when Catherine was older, she actually um, went to her mum for advice because she had a partner who wanted her to take part in like a sex act that she wasn't comfortable with. She didn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. So she went to her mum for advice and her mum just told her to put up with it and stop complaining. So, you know. Great role model she was, eh? Yeah. And Catherine claimed that she was sexually assaulted by her half-brothers until the age of 11. Um, I, I mean, she claimed that she did. I don't know if there was actual... I mean, I think other members of the family have said it as well, but, you know, I don't think anything sort of came of it. I don't, you know, yeah. they weren't punished for it or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So, in 1969, the family moved back to Aberdeen and Catherine attended Muswellbrook High School and she was a bully and so was her twin, Joy. Um, they would fight, but they, they would actually fight with each other, but they would stand up for each other. Like, so if anybody started on one twin, then the other twin would yeah. jump in and be like, no, that's my sister. Yeah. yeah. Which is, I suppose that's, that's a lot of, well, a lot of families, but they oh, did yeah. fight with each other as well. Mm -hmm. um, Catherine once attacked a boy at school with a weapon. And another time she was injured by a teacher who she had attacked and the teacher had acted in self-defense. Oh, wow. Imagine that, like the t a teacher having to act in self-defence mm -hmm. against that's, a child. Yeah, that's awful. Yeah. So needless to say, she was quite a violent mm -hmm. child. It does sound that way. So she left school at 15 without having to having learnt to read or write. And she worked at a clothing factory. But apparently like then, back then and where they lived, like kids leaving school without learning to read or write wasn't such a uncommon thing and like in the where they lived there was um it was really common for the abattoirs and stuff so it was kind of like well that's what you're kind of working towards so the reading and writing bit wasn't a major big deal yeah. um Fair so a year later she got her dream job her words dream job at an abattoir uh -huh. or as some people call it a slaughterhouse yeah um so she started off as a general laborer which involved cleaning up blood and flesh from the floor um, but she was soon promoted to a cutter. So when she first died there, she would watch the pigs being killed. Mm -hmm. And like, cause she'd be up the, up the front, like watching and like our co-workers all thought it was because she wanted to learn. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, it was because she enjoyed it. She she liked seeing these animals being killed. Mm -hmm. um, when she was promoted, like there's obviously a way that we sh you, like that they slit the, the pigs' throats. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously the quickest, the easiest, yeah. whatever. Um and I'm sure she she would have been taught that, wouldn't she? You would get trained oh, for yeah, it and everything. You'd so, get yeah. taught that. Mm -hmm. Um, but she would like to actually like nick an artery and like just watch the pig bleed out. Oh. That's horrendous, and I should have put a trigger warning. <laughs> I was just gonna say, you just told me on my last episode to do that, and you didn't do it either. I know. I actually forgot about that bit. Mm -hmm. Um, she was then promoted to boning, and she was given a set of butcher's knives. And she actually later on she actually hung these knives above her bed so that they would always be handy if she needed them. Oh, right, okay. I don't think she'd have been allowed to take them home. Well, she must have must been. Have been and... I bet you wouldn't get to do that now. No. Um, but I was just thinking, I wouldn't feel safe lying with knives above my head. What if they fell on top of you when you're sleeping? Mm, yeah. What if there's like an earthquake? And... Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's not really a sensible idea. I don't sleep with anything above my head. No, me neither. Um, in 1973, when Catherine was 18, she met David Kellett. He was an alcoholic and he was forever getting into like fist fights, you know, in the pub and stuff like that. And as Catherine was used to this kind of violence, she would actually join in and fight along beside him. So like if, if you got into a fight with somebody in the pub, like, she would be like, whoa, that's my man. And like, <laughs> start like punching them. And like, but she was strong. Like she was a, like, um, I, I, I think she was like a bigger woman. I don't think, not as in, overweight i think like a big sort uh, of you know kind of big big yeah big built and strong mm. and you know maybe i don't know if she's quite maybe quite tall and things right so yes yeah, she would just fight right alongside him um and she, she decided that she wanted to get married and basically just forced him into it you know told him that we we're getting married and that's it yeah. and she just dominated him you know she had she'd done that right from the start and on the day of the wedding she arrived on her motorbike and he was already drunk but then she got there. that sounds like a Great wedding, that. Uh, and his, her mum, sorry, Bar remember Barbara. Barbara actually pulled David to the side before the wedding to have a word with him. And he was quoted as saying, right, so this he, this is what he said. He said, the old, the old girl said to me to watch out. 
You better watch this one or she'll fucking kill you. This is her talking about her daughter. Um, stir her up the wrong way or do the wrong thing and you're fucked. Don't ever think of playing up on her, she'll fucking kill you. And that was her mother talking. She told me she's got something loose, she's got a screw loose somewhere. <laughs> End quote. So, okay. he still went ahead and married her though, even after after that, after that warning from her mum. My mum said in about, that about me, I'd be like, excuse me. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, Thanks mum. Um, and, and, and it didn't take long for her to try and kill him. On their wedding night, <laughs> so that day... <laughs> Jesus Christ. <coughs> Sorry. Oh, that came out of nowhere there. On their wedding night, Catherine tried to strangle him after he fell asleep. And I'm sure you're wondering, why would she do that? Like, what was the reason that after he fell asleep, he's doing nothing wrong? Why would she want to kill him? Well, it was because they'd only had sex three times before he fell asleep. <laughs> right. Her parents... Because, you know, her mum shared all the intimate details. Her parents had done it five times on their wedding night. Oh, oh so, because they did so, do it five times. So three times wasn't enough. You'd be like, maybe you go it once. <laughs> That's it. I'm like, look, bro. <laughs> yeah. Once is fine for me. Like, exactly. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> and fall asleep all you like. See ya. Oh. I'll do the same. <laughs> but yeah, um, luckily he woke up and so she didn't manage to kill him. So... The marriage was violent, though, like, well, obviously. <laughs> I mean, it's been violent on the first night. She's going to say, yeah. Like, for instance, one day when she was heavily pregnant, um, David had arrived home late from a darts match because he'd actually made the finals of the darts match, so he, was, he obviously wasn't expecting him. Yeah, yeah. Came home a bit later. Right. So that's a good thing, isn't it? He'd gone to the finals. Oh, but she burnt all of his clothes and then whacked him over the head with a frying pan. See, those would be the days when you couldn't, like, just send me text or anything and say, no, I've gone through the fire and I'm screwing you a bit, like... <laughs> so, but it just, does it not, like... Like, you don't whack somebody over the head with a frying pan. Like, to me... Do you know that Justin got smacked with a bit of iron with an ex-girlfriend? Really? Yeah. No, that's yeah. awful. Uh, I, I can't remember the Actually, one. I think she does this to somebody later on <laughs> in the story as well. Yeah, because I remember him telling me, and not that we discuss a lot of his ex-girlfriends, obviously, but we... It was a whatever it was. It was a funny story anyway. And they must have had an argument, and she smacked him over the head with a frying pan. Wow! And then I think he'd obviously like landed on the floor. And I think I think she did actually come back to check that it was all right. But I was like, Jesus Christ! That's domestic abuse. I know. I was like, okay, That's well, that awful. one didn't work out then. I know. And like you know, it's not a cartoon. Mm-hmm. Like it damages you to get hit over the head with a frying pan. It's mm-hmm. not like in the cartoons when they just get back up again. Oh, exactly. So he managed to run to a neighbor's house before he collapsed, and they called him an al- ambulance. And it turned out that his, his skull was fractured. Oh, so, if that was just for him being late, I hate to see what else she did to him. No, exactly. So, police wanted to charge Catherine, but she talked David into dropping the charges. Mm. So, in 1976, Catherine gave birth to her first child, Melissa Ann. But soon after, David had had enough. He was sick of Catherine's violent and possessive behaviour. And he left her for another woman and he moved to Queensland. So, the following day after he left... Catherine was seen walking down the street with the baby in her pram, but she was shaking the pram violently and, like, slamming into walls and fences and oh, everything like that, like, just swinging this baby from side oh, to side. Oh, this was the crazy nana. Well, she's not a nana yet. <laughs> oh, oh, right, I thought, I was thinking it was going to be her mum. No, <laughs> oh, right, okay. Okay. she's not a nana yet. Oh, right, you're called... jumping ahead of the story. I thought it was going to be her mum that was the, the crazy no. one. No. I'm sorry. Um... Yeah, so I so she was like being violent with this poor baby in the, mm. um, in the pram. So she she was admitted to St Elmo's Hospital where she was diagnosed with postnatal depression, and she spent a few weeks recovering. But when she was released, she placed two month old Melissa on the railway track when she knew that there was a train due. Oh my god! That so she should have been taken over there then. So she left the baby there. She then stole an axe. She went into town and started swinging the axe at whoever came near her threatening to kill them she was arrested before hurting anyone and was again admitted to St Elmo's hospital but she signed herself out the following day as for baby Melissa I was going to say please tell me you're going to tell me what happened yeah uh, luckily there was a um, a homeless man um, known as old Ted and he was like sort of I think he was just like raking about the place you know maybe looking for food and things like that and he had, he saw the baby and he went and oh, uh, picked her up and um, like literally minutes before the train came. Yeah. Like, so if he hadn't been there... Poor baby, yeah. Oh, and Melissa was going back to Catherine. Really? Mm-hmm. Like, oh, here's your baby back. Oh, my like, God. Mm-hmm. That's awful. 
So, a few days later, on the 3rd of August 1976, Catherine went to the house of one of her co-workers, Molly. So she told her that Melissa wasn't very well and needed to see a doctor. So she asked for a lift. So, of course, Molly's like, yeah, of course. Like, you know, your, your, your daughter's not very well. We need to get her to the doctor's. Um, so they got in the car and her mum and her younger brother went as well. I don't know why, but, you know, they all jumped in the car. Mm. Um, but once they were in the car, Catherine slashed Molly's cheek with a knife and demanded that Molly drove her to Coffs Harbour, which is about six hours away. The reason she wanted to go there was because that's where David's mum, Jean, lived. And Ka Catherine, so she obviously wanted to find out where David was because she didn't know where mm. David was. He'd left her. Yeah. Um, and she, but she later did say that she intended on killing Jean. Sorry. She ca ca intended on asking Jean why David left her. Mm -hmm. Like, as if you didn't... Look, seriously, do you not know why he left you? Oh, well, yeah. Um, and then she was going to kill Jean... And then kill herself. That was the plan. Right. But Molly drove to the nearest service station. So I'm assuming she must have just said, oh, we need to get, if we're going to drive six hours, yeah, we need to, to get, get some, some petrol. Yeah. yeah. So when they got to the service station, Catherine got out of the car and she dragged Molly's brother with her holding the knife to, to his throat. Uh -huh. But the, the police were called and when they arrived, they attacked Catherine with broomsticks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't, did they not have other, like, did policemen not have, like, batons and things and... Well, it was like... Oh, I don't know. But years ago, so... <laughs> they used broomsticks. Oh, okay. And they disarmed her. <clears throat> disarmed her, sorry. So she was admitted to Morissette Psychiatric Hospital and was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. Really? <laughs> so while she was in hospital, Melissa, the baby, went to stay with Barbara and Ken, Catherine's mum and dad. Um, Catherine told the nurses at the hospital that when they were at the service station, she had intended to kill the mechanic... Because he was the person who had repair, repaired David's car, which had allowed allowed him to leave. Because, obviously, he drove his car. Uh -huh. And if his car hadn't been fixed, then he wouldn't have been able to go. Uh, so, so it was the mechanic's fault. Right, got you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, when police... The police informed David of what had happened, because obviously that's her husband, so it had been, like, next to kin kind of thing. Mm. Um, so they, they informed him of what had happened. He left his girlfriend in Queensland, and him and his mother... Uh, Jean came back to Aberdeen to support Catherine and they got back together. Right. On the 9th of... So on the 9th of August 1976, Catherine was released into the care of David and his mum, Jean. So as soon as they left the hospital, they went straight to Catherine's parents' house, to Barbara and Ken's, because um, they went to pick up Melissa. Mm -hmm. And as soon as they pulled up outside, Barbara came storming out the house and was shouting at David, like, blaming him for Catherine's breakdown. You know, it's all... All his fault. It was all his fault, yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, she was the one that told him that her daughter was uh, yeah. going to kill you, etc. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. So, obviously, they were still sitting in the car. They hadn't even got out of the car. So, Barbara reached into the car and was, like, strangling David, like, got a hold around his neck and she's shouting at him, strangling him, strangling him He's at, with her hands around his neck. Sorry, I couldn't get it out properly. And then, so Catherine, she jumped out of the car, stormed round and just punched her mum square in the face, knocked her to the ground and told her never to touch David again. Okay. Right. So, you yeah. know. This is great. <laughs> She's some woman. Yeah, yeah. Totally. Um, so on the 6th of March, 1983, Catherine and David had another daughter called Natasha. But in 1984, Catherine left David. I don't know why. I, I'm not... I don't know what happened there, but um, she took the kids with her. So she first moved into her parents' house and then she moved into a rented house in nearby Muswell, Bro Muswell Brook. So she went back to work at the abattoir, but a year later she injured her back and couldn't go back to work. So she started getting like a disability pension and the government gave her a housing commission residence in Aberdeen. So I think that's something along the lines of what we would call like a council house, I think, and yeah. like assisted sort of, yeah. you know, or I don't know, like affordable living yeah, or yeah, yeah. whatever. Um, so in 1986, Catherine met a guy called David Saunders and he moved in with her and the kids, but he, he did actually keep his own place his own apartment so as you can imagine relationship wasn't great and Catherine would get jealous and suspicious of what David was doing like you kept this apartment so when you're at this apartment what, what are you, you doing, doing? Mm -hmm. so they would have arguments and she would throw him out so just as well he did keep his own place because yeah. they would have somewhere to go to but That's then a little while later she would like go begging for him to come back you know so a little bit animal cruelty just coming up trigger warning 
uh, May 1987, she wanted to give him an example of what would happen if he ever had an affair. So this is just an example, right? If you ever cheat on me, this is the kind of thing that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So she went outside, grabbed his two-month-old dingo puppy and mm -hmm. slit its throat. Oh, why? And then... I'd be like, that is exactly why I'm going to leave you Well, then. he didn't get a chance to say anything because she knocked him unconscious with a frying pan. <laughs> Honestly, like... Uh, oh. Yeah. That poor puppy. Just mm -hmm. no. And that and they hadn't even done anything wrong. No. Even if he had, that's still that's still a no no, no definitely not. Not. But the fact is that was just this is an example of what I'm gonna do. Or what I would do if you ever cheated Seriously. on me. So oh, oh. I just dropped the laptop there. Um a year later in nineteen eighty eight they had a daughter together called Sarah. So David decided to put a deposit down on a house so that you know, family home, you know, we've got Got a kid now. Yeah. So the following year, Catherine, she got compensation for when she hurt her back. Right. So she actually paid off the house. Um, and But she decorated it with, like, animal skins. Because she was, like, she, liked you know, obviously she'd worked in the avatar. She was used to, like, that skin. You know, skin and she'd animals skin animals and stuff like that. So th this was real animal skins. Mm -hmm. Skulls, horns, rusty animal traps, leather jackets, old boots, machetes, rakes and pitchforks all over like that's how it was decorated like um Ugh. there was no space was left uncovered not even the ceiling it was everywhere and i was but the only thing that i was thinking was well for one ugh, yuck how does that say for your kids well, no, cause they if there's up. no space uncovered mm -hmm. well no and no, no. no. <laughs> get a nice wallpaper <laughs> off you go to B&Q and just get some nice wallpaper it's not B&Q B&Q might have existed but well, I don't know if they have it in Australia but you know well, but they're equivalent of somewhere where you can buy wallpaper <laughs> so one day after an argument David hit no sorry Catherine hit David in the face with an iron and then she stabbed him see I told you and then she stabbed him in the stomach with a pair of scissors so he left and he moved back to his own house so he still must have kept his own his own place, even mm. though they'd got the house. Um, he later went back to Catherine's to pick up some of his stuff and she had cut up all of his clothes. So he was like, do you know what? Like, I just can't, I can't do this anymore. So he actually um, said to work, um, he was like, right, I need to take time off. Like, I need to, like, extended leave. Mm. And he actually went into, into hiding. Wow. That's how scared he was. Like, mm. he went into hiding. Okay. So, and Catherine tried to find him, but, like, nobody would tell him, mm. tell her where, where he was. And a few, but a few months later, I mean, he was obviously missing his daughter. Yeah. So he went back to visit her and found out that Catherine had gone to the police and told them that she was scared She was scared of him. Oh, for God's sake. As she had gotten a restraining order against him. Like, oh, this woman. Yeah. So, but she wasn't just abusive to the men in her life. One day when Melissa was about 12, she interrupted Catherine talking to her friend um, so she, she must have had a friend down, they were sitting in the living room, you know, 12 year old has just walked in and interrupted them talking and Catherine got up and punched her in the face. Oh. Um, you know, normal people would be like, Shut up. Aye, go to your room. Aye, look, I've got, I've got company, you yeah. know, what do you want? Like, yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't go punch them. <laughs> no, that's horrendous. Um, and like David Kelly, you know, our, our first husband, he would send his daughters, because remember Melissa and Natasha are his, his daughters, um, like he would send presents for birthdays and Christmases, but Catherine would just throw them away before the kids got to see them. So she would say she would tell them that their dad <sighs> hadn't sent anything. That's awful. So yeah, so after the relationship with David Saunders ended, because obviously he went in a hiding, he was like, no, I have nothing to do with this. She got together with a guy called John Chillingworth. Um, he was a former co-worker of hers. They had a baby boy together. I mean, stop having kids. Oh no. Um, it's probably these men actually want to be with. Yeah, I mean, apparently she was one of these women that was very good at sex and right. getting men to do what she wanted to do, which is really surprising when you see photos of her, you know, and okay, okay. you're like, well, she's, she, you know, I'm not commenting on people's looks, so we'll just not go there. Um, yeah, so they had a baby boy together called Eric, and they were together for three years before she left him. For a man called John Price in 1995. So John Price, he was born on the 4th of April 1955 and he had three children. His children liked Catherine and she moved in. Moved in with them. Well, two, he, he had three children. His two older children, I'm not sure how old they were. But his two older children lived with him. And he had a two-year-old daughter, but she lived 
um, well, the, ah, she was a daughter. The daughter loved Louise's ex-wife. So John drank a lot, but he was also a hard worker. He worked in the mines, um, but he would he would always be first at work. No matter how much he had drank the night before, you know, he'd always be the first one at work. Mm. You know, he, he was a, as I said, he was a hard worker. They went out drinking a lot with friends and they were all loud and boisterous. And when they were throwing a party, like, everyone knew about it. Mm. But, they were, you know, they were having a good time. They were just drinking, having fun, living their best life. But, obviously, mm. cracks soon began to appear and Catherine would be violent and they would fight a lot. At one time... Oops, sorry. One time John tried to leave her. So, to get, re- to, to get revenge... Mm-hmm. This one isn't as bad as the puppy, don't worry. Yep. Um, she got the video camera out and she videoed a first aid kit that she thought that John had stolen from his work. Right. And she took the video to the mines management and Jan... Jan? No, not Jan. John uh-huh. got sacked for it. What? For, for first stealing. Because he was stealing. It was, you know, obviously company policy. You're not allowed to steal. So he got sacked for it. I mean, like, the boss was like, I feel really bad because I really like him, but theft is theft. Like, you know... We have to. But it did actually turn out that he hadn't actually stolen the first aid kit. It was out of date and it had been in the bin. So he'd actually just took it out of the bin. Mm. But he'd worked there for 17 years. And that's what she made him lose his job. What a horrible, horrible woman. Yeah. Spiteful. So just, and that was just because, like, after an argument, just for revenge. Jeez. So he kicked her out that day because no wonder. Yeah, fair enough. Um, but, but he took her back three months later. But he, he wouldn't let her move back in with him. But he lost the respect of a lot of his friends because of it. And like, he even had to change pubs because his friends just couldn't believe that he was back with Catherine and they just didn't want to be around like the, her, really, or their relationship. You know, They knew what she was like. They knew she was violent and they were just like, nah, pff, yeah. I, we don't want nothing to do with it. Mm-hmm. And the arguments were just getting worse and he started to confide in his bosses. So he must have got another job. And... um. So he was confiding on his bosses that he was starting to get really worried about what was going to happen. And every time he, he hit him, like every time she hit him or shouted at him, like he would ring his friend and tell him what happened so that if something did happen to him, then his friend could be a witness mm. as to what had been going on. Yeah. So one day in February 2000, they had a row and Catherine had threatened John with a knife and he like ran out of the house and over at his friends to get away, away from her. And the following day, the police arrived at John's house with an AVO, which is an appre- apprehended violence order, which is to protect victims of domestic abuse, that they, by law, had to take out on Catherine's behalf because she had phoned the police and accused John of being violent towards her. So it's just basically like a restraining order. Yeah. order. Mm. That's awful. But I think back in those... Well, not the way I remember those days, but... It's 2000. Yeah, but I, mean, like, I suppose like domestic abuse still was more people believed the women that they were the victims and the men weren't sort of victims of domestic violence. Yeah, it's only been recently that it really has started to change and people are realising more that it's not just, just women yeah, that are victims. Exactly. Um, but despite this, John stayed with Catherine, but he came to realise that she was capable of anything. The following Monday, John went to work and his boss could tell this was a man who was clearly shaken up. He hadn't seen him like this before and he knew that something was wrong. So John sat down and told him what Catherine had done and she said, I reckon she's going to do me in. So the next day, which was Tuesday the 29th of February 2000, John stopped at the magistrate's court on his way to work and he took out a restraining order to keep Catherine away from him and his children. He told the magistrate that at two o'clock that morning, he had woke up and Catherine was standing at the foot of the bed with her hands behind her back. He jumped out of bed and was like terrified that she had a knife and he was sure that this is it, she's going to kill me. Yeah. But as he kind of jumped up and got closer, he realised that he could see in the mirror that her hands were actually empty. Right. But I think that was just enough for him, just the thought that, yeah, yeah. that this is it, she's going to kill me. Yeah. That's it, had enough, want her out. Yeah. Um, but she wouldn't, she wouldn't leave, so that's why he was like, right, I'm going to court, I'm yeah. going to get a restraining order. But John must have known that something was going to happen to him, though, because later that day, he went over to his friend's house with a couple of beers and he said to his friend, if you see my van out front in the morning when you get up to, when you get up to go to work, call the police. Because if my van's there, that means I haven't gone to work. Mm-hmm. She's done me in. Yeah. So his friend told him, like, not to go home. Like, 
but John was scared that she might kill his children. Like that's how you know that yeah, he, 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 was, he knew that she was capable of anything. Yeah. And he was like, nah, I need to. So he went home about eleven p.m. But actually, none of the kids were at home. She had sent his kids to stay with his mum mm -hmm. or their mum actually. I think their mum. I think it was actually. Sorry, and her younger kids were. So Natasha was older, but um, Melissa and Natasha were older by now. Um, so she sent her younger kids to go and stay with Natasha. So earlier that day, Catherine had gone to her sister's house to pick up the video camera that she'd left there at some point. She then went to Natasha's house and she videoed herself playing with her grandchild. See? Mm -hmm. She's a grandmother. Yeah. So she was playing with her grandmother. Uh, her grandmother. <laughs> she wasn't playing with her grandmother. She was playing with her grandchild. Uh -huh. And in the footage, she had looked at the camera and said, I love all my children. I hope to see you all again. She also videoed her other kids and she was like pushing them to say stuff that was later interpreted as a will. Mm. So it was like as if she, like she, as if she was going to die and it wasn't like maybe like what she, they were going to get when yeah. she dies or what they wanted when she right. died kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so she then took Natasha out for a meal and she asked, so the kids must have sort of, I don't know if Natasha's partner was there or something, so the kids must have stayed there. She took Natasha out for a meal and she asked if her two younger kids could stay there for the night. And Natasha, she must have caught on that something was going on because she actually said, I hope you're not going to kill Pricey and then yourself. Mm -hmm. So she obviously knew. So Catherine and, and Catherine had bought like some like sexy black lingerie earlier that day. But apparently I think she bought it for a second hand shop. So oh, well, la, la. <laughs> <laughs> Yuck. I have I have no issue with second hand clothes, but like not underwear. No. Not not not. No. Oh. Anyway, so um so they had so the she obviously wanted to seduce someone they were gonna and like have sex with them that night, so that mm. that's what happened. So the next morning, the first of March two thousand John's van was still outside the house. Mm -hmm. So obviously, police were called. Yeah. And two officers called Graham and Scott went to the house. They knocked on the door, but they got no answer. And they looked through the letterbox and saw what looked like a bunched up curtain hanging down in the living room. Mm -hmm. So they kept knocking, but nobody was answering. So they thought, right, you know, because I think they must have sort of had some background. They sort yeah, of knew. Yeah, um, so they're like, right, we're going to force entry. So they went around to the back and they managed to break in the back door. And straight away, they saw what they thought was this um, curtain hanging down. So they'd have to like sort of brush, because I think it was like in a doorway, like right. sort of hanging down in a doorway. Uh -huh. So they had to like brush past it. Um, but when Scott's arm touched it, it felt like really, really cold. And he looked down at his arm and his arm was covered in blood. Ooh. The officers realised that it wasn't a curtain and it was actually a human pelt. So basically it was <gasps> the skin of oh a human. Oh my God. Like the no. whole skin. No. It had been like totally skin from oh. in one piece. It wasn't just like bits of skin. It was like one piece. Mm -hmm. And then on the ground there was a torso without a head and without any genitalia. Are you okay? That's disgusting. I know, but are you okay? Yeah. Carry on. Carry up and get done. <laughs> There was blood everywhere, on the door, on the kitchen area, and there was a pot on the cooker, and on the kitchen worktop there were plates that had meals prepared. So they continue, continued to search the house, and they heard a noise coming from one of the bedrooms, and it sounded like a snore, like mm. somebody snoring. So they ran in, and they found 49-year-old Catherine lying on the bed. They tried to wake her, and she wasn't responding. So they carried her outside, they called an ambulance, and it turned out she'd taken an overdose of pills, so... What Natasha thought she was gonna kill Pricey and uh -huh. and then kill herself. That was right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, I don't know. I'm not. I don't know if she was intending on killing herself or just sort of making it look like. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Um. So police started to get statements from witnesses, um, mainly from members of both Catherine's and John's families. And as the investigation got underway, Catherine was kept under close supervision in hospital because she was still unconscious. Um, so while they were waiting for her to, be, to sort of come round and, uh, and be well enough for interviews, forensic investigators set out to examine the house so they could, could determine exactly what happened. So Peter Mus Muscio, a forensic investigator, entered the house through the laundry at the back and he said there was like a sweet odour. It was like a really nice smell. Mm -hmm. and like as a food, like as if your mum was cooking a stew. Yeah. And he walked inside, and one of the first things that he saw was John's skin, the human pelt, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. hanging from the door on a meat hook. Mm -hmm. Further in the kitchen, you could see blood staining on certain items going through to the lounge, and then there was John's body in the hallway. There was blood that John had coughed up on the wall, because you could tell by the way it was splattered. He'd obviously coughed up blood that was splattered all over the wall. Mm -hmm. And there was blood on the light switch from John trying to... Because obviously this... Because it happened at night, so it was, he tried to switch the light on. So from examining the scene, Peter Musio determined that John had been attacked whilst lying in bed. So it's thought that they've had sex and he's fell asleep and then she's attacked him. Mm -hmm. So, and then, you know, he's obviously wakened up and he's tried to run. Mm -hmm. So because the, the blood stains were getting heavier along the walls, but also lower. So he was obviously kind of losing blood. Yeah. And, and he did manage to get to the front door. Um, and I think... and. And there, there was blood spatter on the front, on the door, and on the hand, on the handle as well. So I think he actually had managed to sort of get to the door handle, but it collapsed before he could get outside. Aww. And John had been stabbed thirty-seven times in total, obviously by Catherine. You know, yeah. but th there's no question who no, done it. Definitely not. Um, and where John's body was, it was clear that his whole body, it was clear that his whole body had been there. Because remember, he had it was it was just, um, no head and no genitalia. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's where he collapsed and died, mm -hmm. and then. Catherine skinned him and placed the skin on the carpet beside because you obviously with the blood you can tell and then she took his head off one thing I'll tell you now though is I never found out where his genitalia was oh, right. so I don't know what happened to that um, I thought you were going to tell me it was like cooking or something because of the sweet smell but um, so then you could see that like we should walk through to the kitchen carrying John's head because of the blood dripping obviously you can tell there's a blood trail yeah. of where she went and the blood led all the way to the cooker, to the pot on the cooker. John's head was in the pot with some vegetables. So they then examined the meals that had been set out. There were vegetables, gravy and meat from John's bum. Mm -hmm. So she'd sliced off Lovely. Um, bits like from John's bum uh -huh. and she'd cooked it in the oven like steak. Like steaks. Oh, okay, you're making me feel sick now. <laughs> Sorry. So on the plate, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just going to carry on because... Um, so on the plate, you know, they had like, it just looked like steak with like vegetables right, and gravy okay. in the room. Yeah. And there were five of these steaks. So there was like two on each plate. So there was two plates, two mm. on each plate. And one was, they reckon was probably for the dog because it was like on the ground outside as if it had just been thrown outside for the dog. Um, next to each plate were the names of who the meals were for. So John's two daughters who lived with them that's who the meals were for so Catherine had cooked their dad and was serving him up as a meal to his kids that's, disgusting. that's what she was doing that's actually disgusting and she also left a note on top of a photo of john it was covered in blood and small pieces of flesh and it read this is weird i don't understand this note at all and the the spell on his shit so it said this Stop biting your nails, I can hear Sorry. them. <laughs> well, if I can hear it, it might be picked up on the audio. Um, right, so this note said, Time got you back, Jonathan, for rapping, raping, my do daughter, which is daughter, I know, a doubter, daughter, you two, Beck, which is John's daughter, for Ross, dash, for little John, which is John's son. Now play with little John... John's dick, John Price. So basically, she's saying that he raped her daughter. Um, and it says, you two bet John's daughter. So I don't know if she's accusing him mm. of raping his own daughter and stuff as well. Anyway, Makes no sense. This, these accusations were false. She was, she was just setting herself up with a motive. I mean, personally, what I think is, I'm not sure if she meant to kill herself, but I think maybe she was trying to kill herself. But if that didn't work... Then she was going to have, if she was going to get yeah. charged with murder, this was her motive because he was a rapist. No, and okay. I think that's probably yeah, what it was. Maybe. So five days later, Catherine was interviewed, but she said she couldn't remember anything. Although she did take responsibility for killing John, she just couldn't remember it. Um, she said that she must have done it because of the severe ongoing domestic violence that she had incurred in her during her life and more recently with John Price. Mm -hmm. So she, basically she blamed John for for kill, for her killing him and claimed that she was the victim of domestic abuse, oh, right. and she stabbed. She she's basically uh, snapped and killed him. That's basically what she's saying. But then skinned him and chopped him mm, up. And exactly. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. I mean, like it does happen. You know, like somebody who is a victim of uh, viol um, domestic abuse. Uh, you know, it does happen. They snap and they kill somebody. But that's all that happens. They just yeah. kill them, and then they're like, 
fuck. Yeah. They don't go on to then exactly. do all this, do they? So that's bullshit. <laughs> so she claimed that his violence towards her had been so bad over the time they'd been together that she just snapped and t- couldn't take it anymore. But of course, police interviewed Catherine's past partners and it became apparent mm-hmm. that Catherine was the perpetrator of do- domestic abuse and not the victim feeling, in her relationship. feeling rather relieved at that moment. Well, yeah, I mean, that, well, that's that made me thinking, um, that could have been me. Yeah, it could have been anyone. Um, they found um, the black negl- negligee and, they fe- and it had sperm on it. So the, that's how the police knew that, 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 that they'd had sex. Mm-hmm. She'd killed him and then she stole his wallet and went to the cash machine and withdrew a thousand dollars. Right, okay. And she left the car at her house, which I believe, I think she'd inherited it. Her mum had died at some point, so I think she'd inherited this. So that's how she had her, that house as well. Right, okay. Because um, remember, he hadn't let her move back in oh, with him. Yeah. So she'd left her car there. And that money was never found, so I don't know what that was all about. I don't know why she went and took a thousand pound out, and I don't know what happened with that money. Um, so Catherine initially offered to plead guilty to manslaughter, um, but that was rejected, and she was charged with murder, to which she entered a plea of not guilty. So when the trial started, there were 60 jury prospects, and the judge gave them the option of being excused mm-hmm. due to the nature of the photographic evidence. Yeah. And five of them excused themselves, which I think I'm, I probably would as well. Because yeah. even hearing about it makes me feel sick. Never yeah. mind seeing pictures. Me too. Several more dropped out the following day. So the judge ad- adjourned to the following day. The next morning, Catherine changed her plea to guilty, so the jury was dismissed. The judge ordered a psychiatric assessment to make sure that Catherine understood the consequences mm-hmm. of a, a guilty plea and that she was fit to make such a plea. Her legal team had been planning on claiming amnesia, and disassociation, but she was considered sane after the ass- yeah. assessment, mm-hmm. so that was out of the window. Yeah, totally. So two two psychiatrists concluded that she did suffer from borderline personality disorder, but obviously that doesn't make you kill somebody. You know, no. there's millions of people that have got that, yeah. you know, so that doesn't make you murder somebody. Exactly. Um, so at the sentencing hearing, Catherine's lawyers asked if she could be excused to avoid hearing some of the facts. Oh, wow. And they got a hard no. It's like, no, you committed these. Uh-huh. Why, like, why should, like, of course you have to hear it. Oh, exactly. You don't want to it. Exactly. So, and when the skinning and decapitation was dis- described, Catherine became hysterical and had to be sedated. How? You did it. You managed to do it at the time. Yeah. So, Catherine Knight was sentenced to life imprisonment. The judge refused to fix a non-parole period and he ordered that her papers be marked. Never to be released. Good. Because she's vile. And there you go. Thank you for that. So she is definitely the worst nana. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. So <laughs> thank you to everybody for listening. Mm-hmm. And if you'd like to join us on Patreon to get some bonus episodes, it's patreon.com slash crime divers. If you'd like to follow us or get in contact with us, our information is in the show notes. And if you don't already, please don't forget to subscribe, rate and review. Thanks for listening. See you next week. Bye.